welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. And I'm Goose. Nice to see you here at the top of the show, Goose. Yes, a rare occurrence. Well, you guys did ask me to be here. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's because we have a very special episode of Good Game, one to digest kilos of chocolate by. We're going to be looking back over three immense decades of gaming to determine which was the greatest of them all. Yes, and you're quite a fan of the 80s, aren't you, Goose? Ah, uh, yes. Just call me Hipster Goose, as you guys do already. But yes, I believe the 80s hold the most potent retro gaming nostalgia. Yeah, not to mention a complete console market crash that almost destroyed the industry. No. Guys, you know my position. It was the noughties that brought forth some of the most important games to date. Not to mention, saw the industry become the entertainment leader that it is today. Obviously, you're both completely wrong. The 90s is where all those genres began, from RTS to MMO to FPS. OK, guys, well, clearly we kind of agree to disagree, which is why I spent my whole Easter break doing my homework Putting this together, it's a thoroughly convincing case on why I believe the 80s are still the greatest. On VHS? Yeah. Well, at least it's not beta, I suppose. Uh, I have my uh, Naughties argument on authentic HD DVD. Well, that's all very nice, but I think the one with the most fidelity to his argument and his media is the gamer sitting here with the laser disc. <laughs> OK, well, uh, Goose, I guess we should start with you. All right. The 1980s was the best gaming decade, bar none. Like every great art form, it was the time period just after it had been created, but before it became overly mainstream, that video games literally blasted into our living rooms. You could even go so far as to call it the renaissance period of gaming, and I will. The 80s is where I began my personal love affair with gaming. Back in the 80s, when I was a gamer, it was all about Spectrums and Commodore 64s, and then later the Amiga, very much the birth of so many concepts that are still kind of effective today. I think the 80s was the most important decade because people played games when they were almost all universally awful. Because the 80s was boring. It was like a giant 80s party. You couldn't leave. The 80s was the first and the last decade where gaming captured the imagination of the public at large. It was a period where computers and video games felt like they had unlimited potential. If you want any proof of that, just look at some of the films they were making back then. Stop! I'm warning you. I'm gonna have to put you on the game grid. David Lightman was a master at computer games. It started with a game. Last Starfighter. You're gonna bust the record! The Last Starfighter, exactly. You know, there it was. We were gonna be these kids. We were gonna lead the world into a bigger and brighter future, and technology was the way we were gonna do it. Apparently, if you spill champagne on a computer, it will start interrupting your love life and fall in love with your girlfriend and steal her. These are great concepts. Why don't they make films like this anymore? We are still suffering from the hangover of how Hollywood represented gaming in the 80s. This computer company is coming out with these amazing new games in a couple of months, and I want to play those games. These microcomputers were still surrounded in mystery, thanks mainly to an information-starved environment. We didn't have internet or search engines, so we had to rely on things like magazines, word of mouth, and even urban legend. Sometimes you'd make an important purchase based solely on the box art alone. You picked up the box and there was this fantastic box art, and you'd get home and put it in the console and... OK, that doesn't quite match that, but it doesn't matter. When you bought a game then, all you had to go on was a box art, so it was just so all important. But I did buy some games that pretty much had hand-drawn box art at the time because the title sounded cool or was like, oh, does this game look anything like the artwork on the box? Uh, spoiler, they didn't. It was an era of high stakes, to say the least. Permadeath was the norm, with home games matching the coin-guzzling fury of the arcades. Ah, yes, the arcades. When you think about it, they were all dark dungeons full of delinquent deviants, but it was where you could get the best gaming hardware and the newest. It's that moment of walking into a room and seeing something that will just dazzle you for the first time. Word would go around the arcade that you were on the second last or third last level, and gradually people would come around, so you'd be surrounded by, you know, 20, 30 people. I have no idea what my high score was. I was in the top three for a while, but a guy with some pretty questionable initials eventually bumped me off. 
games back in the 80s were just harder. The spoiled gamers of today find the difficulty of something like Dark Souls a jarring experience, and that's actually kind of sad. Back in the day, games would kick your butt and you would love every minute of it. You know how the save points in games back then were just really hard? And I'd got halfway through a really difficult level and I had left the console on overnight and I was petrified that my housemate was going to come home and turn it off. There was a bit they put in the middle of the game where you had to jump over a river and my friend and I would beat each other up in real life because he would headbutt me into the river. By definition, this face-melting difficulty also lent to a game's longevity. If you couldn't actually finish a game, well, it kind of lasted forever. Some of today's games are way too much like today's movies where you forget the story and the plot by the time the credits start rolling. The 80s sparked our imaginations and the imaginations of small indie development teams who in turn flooded the market with every sort of game you could imagine. It was almost like the Wild West, you know, because people were just creating these games on teams of two, if you were lucky. There was no real definition of what made the game good or what made the game bad. People were just pulling out. I've not had any less fun having to play a llama or an egg or some of the strange things that 80s video games made me play. They were still really addictive fun. There's a reason so many games today are going retro, revisiting old gameplay and graphic styles that were not only born in that era, but they were also tough enough to stand the test of time and still be around today. And there's no other genre tougher than the scrolling beat-em-up. Double Dragon, <laughs> Altered Beast, oh, oh. Golden Axe. In these worlds, a stroll down the street was a fight for justice, masculinity unbound. In the 80s, if a game asked you if you were a bad enough dude to rescue the president, it was a rhetorical question. Unlike today's gaming heroes, racked by uncertainty and guilt, and I haven't even touched on the aesthetics of the technology itself, today we've got hard drives, soulless little black boxes, but back then we had floppy disks, snug in their little paper envelopes, they were physical, they were visceral. Uh, if you knew enough people, you had access to all the games, there was a lot of uh, playground sharing going on uh, back in those days. Flicking through a disk box was as satisfying as browsing a vinyl record collection. Every chunk of gaming hardware had an unmistakable physical presence. This is how long I've been gaming. My first console was made of wood. Wood. Then we were introduced to the two front runners in the console race of the 80s. The Nintendo Entertainment System. We're only on the Sega System. Sega. The NES and the Master System. I'm just going to give you a moment and let that nostalgia really sink in. Today, these things are relics to be collected, hunted down out of old dusty cupboards and proudly put out on display. Above all, this was an era of art through adversity. The technical limitations of the time didn't actually constrain the game makers, it liberated them. Famously, Shigeru Miyamoto made the most of his chunky pixels and he gave Mario exaggerated features. To this very day, he's defined by his overalls, his nose, his hat and his moustache. And he didn't speak, like when he jumped, there was no wahoo, he just... Silent, got on with the job, did his plumbing, got rid of the monkey, rescued He didn't even have a princess girlfriend back then. When confronted with lo-fi synthesizer chips, composers rose to the challenge, their soaring synth symphony still echoing through the years. Just look at the soaring popularity of chip tunes. The technology moves forward, but the aesthetic remains. Why? Because it's retro, because it's just so cool. Now, admittedly, I only got five out of these 10 amazing years, but that hasn't stopped me, like many others, going out and embracing my hipster gamer, playing some of these incredible games, collecting these classic consoles, all just so I could relive a brief moment of this amazing time in gaming history. I take my hat off to those developers back then who, you know, in my mind, are some of the most creative people you could possibly be. I think it's because, you know, we supported these games that uh, we have such an amazing payday now and we have such an amazing industry. None of this would be here if it wasn't for that, that growth, that burst of creativity uh, of those great personalities and companies that started really thinking about video games more as a form of entertainment rather than a diversion and something to, to swallow your coins at the arcade.
it's not just nostalgia, it's fact. The 80s were the most important decade in gaming. So don't talk to me about 4K tellies, solid state drives or teraflops. For true gaming, look no further than the 80s. There we go. All right, guys, how radical were the 80s? Well, I mean, there is something to be said, I guess, for gaming in a simpler time. Exactly. Yes, things certainly were simpler. Of course, we all know where gaming really began, and that was in the 90s. Gaming in the 1990s. What more do I need to say other than this? Doom, Tomb Raider, Diablo, Sonic, Warcraft, Starcraft, Pokemon, Final Fantasy, Resident Evil, Mortal Kombat, Monkey Island, Need for Speed, Ocarina of Time, Super Mario 64, Half-Life, Battletoads. I rest my case. Actually, I don't, because the 1990s, even ignoring all of these revolutionary genre-defining games, was still a revolutionary decade, and in my opinion, the bestest. Let's start with this, the CD-ROM. This magical silver shiny disc brought us full motion video, which is sadly lacking from today's games. Well, duh, obviously. Why did we think this was cool? I saved you some money again. Aren't you happy? It's like the video game and equivalent of, of flares. Yeah, why don't we all make our own way? It allowed our eyes to be spoiled with pre-rendered graphics and caressed our ears with pristine Red Book audio. You're all mine! CD media may have added long, long loading times, but we no longer had to install PC games to our hard drives from a teetering pile of your beloved floppy disks, Goose. And also CD Media had much more storage space, so it freed up developers from the restrictions of cartridges. PlayStation 1 came out and I had to put this disc in. I was just like, this is crap. I could break this easily. I could snap it in two. Why can't I have my cartridges? I wanted a Nintendo 64. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man. Check up your stuff. I got a little surprise for you here. Check it out. But in a sense, moving from cartridges to CD-ROM was this symbolic leap to the mainstream. Cartridges were only for games, CD-ROMs were for everything. CDs also made it easier for our transition from pixels to polygons, as games in the 90s started to deliver us eye-watering 3D worlds. Final Fantasy VII, TIE Fighter, Descent. Oh, which way is up? Oh, I feel sick. The good kind of sick. Unreal. Unreal it certainly was. In a mere six years, we went from playing what was the very first first-person shooter in Wolfenstein 3D to playing one of the genre's best with Half-Life. So that was the era when the first-person shooter and 3D uh, was emerging, and I think that 3D is the biggest single revolution in computer gaming history. The 90s also delivered us hardware improvements for gaming in high resolutions, external camera engaged, sharper textures, and glowy lighting. The sexy graphics accelerator became an essential component to any serious gamer's PC, even if you were still just playing LucasArts point and click adventures. Even though 3D technology had technically begun before the 90s, it wasn't until the 90s that it felt truly solid. And that's the core of the 90s. That's what it really was about. Huge jumps and leaps in technology and visuals. At the start of the decade, we had Street Fighter 2. But by the end of the decade, we had Soul Calibur. Can you look at the leap between those two games? It's just tremendous. You can't even begin to define the 90s by any one title. Gaming just grew tremendously during that period, so it's just almost impossible. And we needed those accelerated frame rates too. You are tied for the lead. PC gaming was becoming increasingly competitive with the advent of local area networked multiplayer. And this led to what I consider to be my most treasured gaming memories. I still remember the day when I worked out how to hide our copies of Quake on the school network, where just a few keystrokes would launch you into a game on any computer within the school. And when 3pm rocked around, all learning within the school was forcibly put to a halt as our frag fest dragged that network to a slow crawl. Ah, oh, the memories. I challenge you to find anyone who went to a LAN party in the 90s and didn't think it was awesome. But 
the starting time was always midnight. You wouldn't sleep. It's that traditional looking LAN party that you see on television and in movies. It's like geeky and loud. The ones that I went to were just amazingly frustrating because you'd spend six hours sitting around waiting for a game to start. It would start and be over in two minutes and then there'd be an hour of accusations of cheating. I remember having Doom death matches and stuff like that and the screaming that was going on and you would think someone was being murdered. And not only were they awesome, but they were a friendship bonding experience. And you just don't get that same feeling of camaraderie nowadays when you log on to some low quality third party chat program and play games together remotely. But let's rewind for a moment because the 90s also brought us the golden age of couch gaming. Super Mario Kart, Street Fighter 2, Micro Machines, NBA Jam, Rock and Roll Racing, Toe Jam and Earl, Battletoads again, couch gaming. And the difference is you can still sit down with a SNES or a Mega Drive and play those games with a friend on the couch and they're still fun. And let's not forget where these experiences led us, to intense four-player split-screen gaming, just one console later on the N64 with GoldenEye. GoldenEye, I mean, what can you say about GoldenEye? It was the greatest game you had ever played, and you played it all the time. Me and my brother would play 1v1 constantly. I played all those levels to death. I got all the cheats by, you know, you used to have to speed run the levels to earn the cheats. I got all of them, and I'm sure these are familiar stories. Nothing beats sticking physical cardboard onto your TV to stop your friends from cheating. Nowadays, everything is so impersonal. Gamer tags with more numbers than letters in their names blink in and out of a match with no regard to what the team objectives are. Goose, you can sit there in your cold, dark room, slowly adjusting the volume wheel of your rickety Commodore 64 cassette loader, feeling the weight of that exceptional loneliness. While the more enlightened of us in the 90s were watching gaming explode into the mainstream on print and on television. We had a plethora of great gaming magazines at the local newsstand, and they had pure gold stuck to the cover in the form of demo discs. When a magazine had a full free game on the cover, oh my god, it was like it was like bloody pigeons fighting over a chip. They were just like people were just going crazy in the news agents trying to fight over these magazines. There was just no need to rely on the blurb on the back of the box when you could trust informed opinions and read about the games and even play them before you purchase them. Aussie mags like Hyper, Megazone and PC Powerplay were leading the charge in celebrating gaming culture. There was someone always playing games and there was always someone bringing in new games. It was kind of a crazy fun time period, um, especially at the beginning of it, because there was more people really coming into the, the magazines all the time. The industry was growing, so there was new companies. So it was a really fun time period. Um, and it's probably showed in a lot of the magazines. It was a lot of in-jokes. I just had so many memories of flicking through previews, looking at screenshots of games. Oh my God, look at Final Fantasy VI, look at Chrono Trigger, this looks insane. I just lose my mind. Nowadays, anyone can start up a website and spew forth a bunch of nonsense where they take four frickin' paragraphs to get to the point of the article. But back then, oh, back then, you would have these big, epic, eloquent Sega versus Nintendo debates that would sprawl for issues and issues over many years, and they were in print, and you held them in your hands. Meanwhile, on TV, Channel 9's The Zone did its best to break gaming's geeky image. So hang on to your joysticks. Stand by to be zoned. UK's ITV fired up the cybernet. Aliens who may or may not be your enemy were completely computer generated. And Americans had video power, where playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a gladiatorial experience to the digital death. Make sure you get to him before his bombs get to you or your history. Everyone wanted a slice of gaming, as it was finally being established as a legitimate pastime. Games are also attracting some pretty big Hollywood talent. Mark Skywalker Hamill and Malcolm McDowell on the deck of the TCS Lexington in Wing Commander 4. Good to see you too, Colonel. Or, or should I say farmer Lair. Dennis Hopper in Black Dahlia. I mean, who knows what kind of suffering the world would see. Chris Walken in Ripper. Hell of a lot more splatter. Victoria Morsel in Phantasmagoria. <laughs> okay, no one remembers her, but these guys in Rebel Assault 2 brought Star Wars to life. Configuration looks imperial. Copy that. No, wait, there's two more. Okay, I think I've got it. 
Rumor Lane, I didn't expect to find the likes of you here. How'd you end up on Imdoc? The 90s also took us from the big screen to the littlest of screens with our first serious gaming handhelds. I personally had a Sega Game Gear where I'd pump the likes of Echo the Dolphin and many other games, but it also had a Master System adapter that you would stick in the back and you could play Master System games. And you could even get an adapter that turned it into a television. Oh my god. And only a few years later, the new Game Boy Color and Pokemon, yet another phenomenon born in the 90s. And that's because the 90s was full of firsts. Another game changer was the MMO, which was born thanks to a little thing called the internet. I'm sure you've heard of it. Transform the planet forever. Made popular in the 90s. And what a sight that was to see another avatar in my game for the first time, controlled by someone else connected remotely by a modem. It was magic and didn't go unappreciated. This was a cyber utopia of fledgling online communities learning to coexist in a brave new world. It was truly exciting. And you really can't appreciate something unless you didn't have it before. Nowadays, the internet is taken for granted. Trolls are everywhere and so many games require you to be online all the time, even just to load the thing in single player. I'm sure by now that you're convinced that the 90s was the best decade of all. But just when you thought there couldn't be any more watershed moments, it was also the decade that gave us the analog thumbstick. Nintendo's versatile N64 controller delivered that fine degree of movement that we needed to traverse our shiny new 3D landscapes. And there you have it, my case for the greatest gaming decade. The technological leaps and bounds, the genres that were formed, and the memories and experiences that were forged which can never be replicated. And that's why the 90s is the best. There we have it, the 90s, the nostalgia, the technology, the grandeur. Yeah, I actually forgot how many great franchises started up in the 90s and they're still going today. Yes, yes, a convincing argument, but I think even in the 90s we all knew that the best was yet to come. Well, I'd let Goose and Bajo have their say, but now I'm afraid the time has come to blow them away. When the nostalgia goggles come off, there's just no comparing the latest, the greatest gaming decade, the noughties. It was the decade that gaming finally opened up and grew up. Sure, I loved Angelina Jolie and Hackers, but that classic 95 flick was really the last gasp of the mystique of computing. Game's over. PCs and gaming are now part of all of our lives. In the 80s and 90s, gaming meant limitations. Eight colour graphics, three channel sound, floppy disks. It was hell. What the Naughties brought was gaming without limits. What the Naughties brought was freedom. Through the 90s, every single gamer, I think, fantasised about this amazing open world. Games became adult, maybe in a bad way to begin with. Eventually, I think in a good way. Fallout 3, the Grand Theft Auto series. Yakuza series as well. You could just really just punch days into those games and lose yourself in them. The freedom of broadband internet made rich online gaming experiences like World of Warcraft possible. A far cry from the text-only muds of my halcyon youth. Broadband also smashed the shackles that chained us to bricks and mortar stores. I mean, I no longer need to go outside to buy a game. I don't even need to get dressed. I can just stay inside in my jammies with my tea and my biscuits and my cats, and I can browse through thousands and thousands of titles online at 3 a.m. if I wanted. I mean, tried doing that in 1987. You've cut out that middleman of having to produce a retail copy. With, with things being able to be downloaded, it's so much more readily accessible to a large audience. Downloadable content means the end of scarcity. Books can be out of print, but not games, not anymore. And my choices are no longer defined by what the big game companies think I should be buying. No matter how retro niche or strange your tastes, there's an indie out there who's got your number. You started to see the bedroom coder coming back into existence, and I think that was a, probably one of the most important things to happen to games. Fresh little companies, whether it be two or three or a dozen people, who would just take risks and do clever, creative things. 
say I was surprised to see Goose argue the merits of living in an age of ignorance. I had a ball playing Oblivion in one window with an FAQ and maps open in another, outlining all the best places to find Nern Root. Now, thanks to an endless online encyclopedia of guides, handy tips and user-generated resources and discoveries, I can nibble on facts from a cornucopia of content to maximise my gaming experience. Not to mention, when it comes to opinion, there are no more secrets and no more lies. Sites like Metacritic give a voice to everyday gamers, not just the critics. The truth will out. And yes, Bajo the Age of Split Screen Gaming was fun, but you and I have had some of our best gaming experiences online talking trash over voice chat. Add jammies, tea, and cats, and you've got gaming heaven. Yeah, I'll see you. Oh my god! Oh my god! This is the most exciting moment for me. I've been so alone for so long. I don't want to be alone anymore. I love a medieval romp as much as anyone, but I don't actually want to live in the Middle Ages. They say abandoned houses became monsters' lairs. My point is, there is no going back. The genres of the past seem so stagnant to us now because modern hardware has made so much more possible. Drift, just under 1500k. Complex, believable characters, masterful animation, and plots so involved, so complex, that they even span multiple games. Shepard, it was not a malfunction. This was a trap. Big screen TVs, big hot HD flat screen TVs, I think, probably more than anything, opened up gaming to everybody. to say after seeing something in like 720p or 1080p for the first time I could not go back. Okay everyone has those visuals. Now what you're gonna do with them? What you how how are you gonna elevate yourself above the rest now? So I think that's why we're starting to see games become a lot more interesting now. Gallagher and Mass Effect are both games about fighting space invaders, but only one has the depth and nuance to hold your interest for two dozen hours. And only one has Femship. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Getting a lot of bullshit on this line. Oh yeah, phone gaming. There are millions of games and apps, and they're cheap. Often they're free, and they're always with you. I love mobile gaming. I love playing games on Android. I love playing games on anything you can have a game on. I will play that game. Kind of takes away that scary element and makes gaming more accessible for people. And it provides a, a, a great place for developers to create games. In the lift, on the bus, in the wilderness, I can be out in the middle of nowhere and playing some bubble shooter while I'm at it. And every day all this gear gets faster, better, and cheaper. When it comes to gaming, I don't want steampunk, I want Star Trek. Yeah, I suggest we arm our weapons and raise shields now in case of trouble, Captain. Ultimately, this diversity is a very good thing. More genres, more heroes, and heroines means gaming is more inclusive than ever. Now we have a world beyond just dude bro shooters. We have a gaming experience for everyone. This is the most fascinating area in gaming at the moment, moving forward. Um, Different genres are starting to be explored. This is the era where we could first start to genuinely describe video games as an art form. At the end of the day, well, there is no end to the evolution of video games. The noughties is better than the 80s and the 90s because each decade is better than the last. And I have a feeling that the decade we're in now will be even better still. Good game. Well, there we have it. I win. Uh, just because you went last doesn't make you the winner, Hex. What? <laughs> Guys, you both put forward some pretty good arguments. I was swayed slightly. Looks like we're going to have to turn the verdict over to you, the good game viewers. Jump on all that social media stuff and let us know who you thought had the most convincing argument. You know, guys, I'd actually like to see a viewer put forward an argument for why the 70s were the best. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they did have that Magnavox Odyssey, which was the very first game in console. And the Atari 2600 came out in 1977. Ah, oh, they had Pong and, um, was it Space Wars? You know, we could actually have all been wrong. I think the 70s could have been the best. Uh, all right, I think we're going to have to just continue this argument back in the office. Until mm. next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Goose out, Bajo out. The 70s would be disagreeing. Well, no, hang on, listen. The 70s were group. If you think about the 70s, it may be a starting point, but, um... I don't... Ugh.